Thank you. Okay, welcome. Thanks for being here. Yeah, it's so early in the morning uh, after last night, but luckily I made it today. Um, so did, has everybody here, here heard about Stack or know anything about it? Okay, all right. Well, uh, I'm going to um, go into some detail as to what Stack is and then go into sort of the open source ecosystem of tools that uh, have been developed for... Um, for demonstrating stack. It's still very much under development, so um, the spec is, is changing uh, somewhat rapidly, um, but we're hoping that by next year we'll have a version one. So the first question is why? Like, why do we need stack? When I bring this up, stack, the usual response is why do we need another standard? Um, and the reason why is that there's all these different data portals out there, all these geo portals. Everybody has their, their own portal for their own data. And sometimes they include Landsat data and public data sets, uh, but it's all, um, every one of them is something different. You have to go to each one of these. If you want to find all the data for a certain area, you have to go to all these different portals. And if you're using the API, the situation is actually perhaps even a little worse programmatically. Everybody uses different Field names uh, such as Cloud Cover, Landsat might use Cloud Cover Land. Another place might use Min Cloud Cover, Max Cloud Cover. Uh, there's no consistency there, and so if you're doing this programmatically, you need to essentially have a client for every single data source. So, the way that I explain Stack is that it's really three different things. Uh, the first thing is it's a, it's a metadata model. It's a single metadata model with defined fields for what to call things so that we can all agree, irregardless of the data source, what cloud cover is, what the uh, sun azimuth angle is. Uh, the focus here is on search and discovery. So if it's a metadata field that a user isn't going to search on, then it's not something that we would probably include in Stack. It's something that we'll... That, that is probably better off n not having. And we want it to be simple and extensible so that depending on the type of data, the content in, in the data, whether or not it's EO or SAR uh, or um, LIDAR, that uh, it, we can add fields as necessary depending on the data type. The second thing that it is, and this is a critical point here, is that it's a, uh, it's a way to define links between catalogs, collections, and the underlying items for the data so that they can be crawled and indexed by a search engine. The idea here is that if your data cannot be crawled and indexed, then it doesn't exist. Um, if people can't find it, then they can't use it. And so this is a really important point. We want to be users to be able to, data providers to be able to provide stack metadata as a series of static files so that they don't actually necessarily have to stand up any sort of service. They can just provide the metadata files, and then that can be searched and indexed by, uh, by some service. The third thing is that it is, is a dynamic API for searching the catalog and getting the results as GeoJSON. Uh, now, stack actually doesn't, doesn't really define this. We use WFS3, or what's called OGC API features now, uh, with stack extensions built on top of that. So what it is not, it's not a full-fledged metadata standard that data providers would use for their own data sets. Uh, Landsat, for instance, has a bunch of metadata that they use internally to track things. Uh, Planet has a bunch of metadata. This isn't a replacement. Data providers aren't going to take this and use this for their internal systems. Um, we're not trying to replace all these other existing metadata standards. Here, we want a simple metadata standard for, again, focused on search and discovery. Uh, the uh, stack spec started about a year and a half ago on the tail end of uh, state of the map US in Boulder. And uh, it's been rapidly uh, iterated on, uh, and the way that we've been developing it is focusing on um, developing the spec and then implementing that. 
and the implementations help inform what the spec should look like. So rather than trying to come up with a specification sort of separate in a room with a bunch of people and we think that this is going to work, it's uh, let's try this out, let's index catalogs, let's deal with a bunch of data like Landsat or, or Sentinel where you have millions of scenes and see how this works and how the searching works uh, and, and what needs to be improved. There's been a variety of uh, contributors involved here. We've had, uh, as on the previous slide, we've had four sprints. We have another one in another month. Uh, and there's, there's really been a lot of excitement and input from, from a lot of different groups. So now I'm just going to jump into some details about what, what the specification is. So there's these different entities in Stack. There's catalogs, collections, and items. So a catalog is fairly simple. It's just a container for other things. It's a container for collections and items. A collection is a way to group similar items. So Landsat 8 is a collection, or could be a collection. Sentinel 2 level 1 could be a collection. The concept of collections is flexible enough so that really, as a data provider, you can group your collections and your items however it is that you want. Uh, let's say you uh, have a bunch of uh, post-disaster data from a hurricane from a bunch of different sensors. That could be a collection. There's nothing that, spec that says that a collection has to come from one type of sensor. It's however you want to group your data. And then the items themselves are the scenes, if you will. It's a, it's a when and a where. Um, it's, it's data of a certain footprint that was taken at a certain time or a range of times, perhaps in the case of a mosaic. The catalog looks like this. Uh, the main things that are required here uh, are stack version. That you're going to see that in, in all of the entities. We, we, we need to have the stack version. Uh, the important thing is the ID and really the links here. And you, you want to describe your, your, your catalog. Now, links, I mentioned before that links are, are, are a pretty important part of stack. And they are. Uh, they're required. It's a way that we link together catalogs to collections, to items, and items back to their parent catalog and their parent collection. Uh, but they're not just for that. And these are the hierarchical links that describe those relationships. But they're not just for describing these relationships. Uh, we encourage judicious use of links. So you might have an about page. You might have documentation on the data set. Uh, you might have um, a GitHub page of some code to use it. Use those links however you want. You can provide links to, to anywhere. The collection, so a collection uh, inherits from a catalog. So you see a lot of the, a lot of the same fields here. Um, we have a license as well. We have extent to describe the spatial and temporal extents of everything in there. Uh, the properties, I'd like to point out, is perhaps one of the most important things here. Uh, and I'll show some examples in a bit. Uh, but properties are a way to take properties of items that are common across the entire collection and not have to reproduce them in every single item, but move them to the collection level. And now we have the item fields. Um, this is a GeoJSON feature. So you see that the type is required, and it must be set to a feature. And we have all the typical GeoJSON fields. We've got bounding box geometry. Uh, again, we have links. The other important things are the properties and the assets. The properties, the only thing that's required is the date time. Um, there's some other time stamps in there. Uh, so the date time here combined with the geometry at the top level. This is essentially what describes, describes your item. Now, there's not a whole lot of info here, right? There's not a whole lot of, lot of fields. Um, oh, and I'll, let me talk about assets first. So the assets is, this is what's in your item, and this is the underlying data. Of course, this is what's, what everybody is interested in. You have a link to the data, uh, you have a title, you have a media type to describe the file format of that, and um, all right, I think I'm missing a slide, but that's all right. Uh, the, or I don't know, maybe it's later. All right. Uh, this is just a GIF uh, popping through a collection here. This is a static 
catalog. So uh, you're, you're going to see a bunch of fields here that I didn't talk about yet. All right, but here's our assets at our collection level. You see there's no, um, there's no actual links there yet. Here's our links. These are a bunch of hierarchical links. We see that they point to child. You'll see that they're relative links because this is a static catalog. So I have to actually type in the new link here. I can't just follow the link. Uh, but if you're crawling this programmatically, you just follow those relative links based on the self uh, link. OK, and the uh, content extension. So this is where we add data, additional fields to our items, depending on the type of data that it is. So we have an EO extension. This is where all of the stuff that's relevant to EO. We have SAR. Um, we have point cloud extension. So this is why, at its core, the stack core is actually really quite simple. Um, we only have that, that when and the where, basically. And this is where we, we add in our, our, our data-specific fields. So this is what the EEO extension looks like. This is the only one that I'm going to talk about. It, it's, it was the first one that happened. It's the one that's most mature. It's, it's the one that we have a bunch of catalogs for. Uh, you've got a resolution. You've got a platform. You've got an instrument. Uh, cloud cover is, is really important. That's something that people are going to search on. And we have some geometry angles of the sun and the, and the ge viewing geometry from the platform. And these all go in the properties of the items. If they're common, like if the field is the same for all of the items in a collection, you can take that out of the item, move that up to the collection. Now, of course, cloud cover right, is not going to be the same among all your scenes, I suppose, unless you have a collection of 0% cloud cover scenes, and then perhaps you could. Um, but things like platform, constellation, instrument, those are commonly going to be put at the collection level. Uh, the EO band object is, a, uh, is, is a, uh, an array of dictionaries. And each one of those describes some details about the actual band, such as the wavelengths and the resolution, because the resolution could be different depending on the band. Uh, the resolution at the top level is, is the best resolution for the entire data set. Uh, but here, I want to point out that we have this common name. And a common name is, is, is pretty important because it encapsul encapsulates, um, I suppose, how we, how we most commonly use this data. Uh, if you've used Landsat and Sentinel, no doubt you've had to go online, find the table, find what the band numbers are, every single time, right? Because you might not necessarily remember what they are. Uh, here, we have, for a lot of EO instruments, you have a lot of the same types of bands. The wavelengths might change a little bit, but the red band is going to be approximately uh, in the same range for all of them. Uh, so we've defined a bunch of common band names. Uh, you'll notice that some of them, such as SWEAR 1.6 and SWEAR 2.2, um, they're not just named SWEAR 1 and SWEAR 2, uh, because those numbers there represent the average center wavelength, uh, just so that it's easier to remember. Uh, SWEAR 1.6 represents the SWEAR band that's commonly centered around the atmospheric window at 1.6 microns. Because uh, if you have a SWEAR band on your instrument, it's going to be centered around either 1.6 microns or 2.2 microns. Uh, it's the same thing in the near IR. The uh, regular near IR band is typically a broadband. Uh, covering the entire spectral range, whereas uh, near uh, the near IR um, 08 and 09 are, are narrower bands centered around uh, uh, around those wavelengths. So the way that we link the assets to the actual bands that are used in them uh, is through this EO bands field here. Um, it's just an indexed array that shows you what the order of the bands are in the assets. And this is a simple case here in the case of Landsat because we have bands separated by file, but they need not be. You could have uh, three bands. You could have red, green, blue, and you would just indicate that in the array. So now I'll just go over quickly the uh, stack ecosystem here. Uh, these are the software tools that have risen out of it. Again, these are all pretty much in development. Uh, first, perhaps the most important thing is uh, done by our, our friends here at Spark Geo, is the stack validator. Uh, it's a spec, 
So you need a way to validate the metadata. Uh, so there is a uh, library for this, and there's also a website, stacklint.com. So you can drop in your uh, metadata and, and validate that for any version of Stack. And if you have any questions, you can talk to James right here. Uh, the Stack Browser. So now you're all familiar with these static catalogs that are linked to each other. So the Stack Browser is a way to navigate through these static catalogs. Um, you start up at the catalog. This is, there's no way to search here, right? These are just static files. They've not been indexed. You, you can't search them. But this is a convenient way to browse through a catalog. Um, look at the preview. This is going to be a thumbnail uh, or perhaps a cog in this case, if it's available. And uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a nice way to browse through the catalog. Uh, however, it is, um, it's organized. In the case of Landsat, you might have uh, things organized by path row. In this case, this is post-disaster data after Hurricane Harvey. There's also a QGIS plugin. This was written at the last Stack Sprint. Um, <clears throat> and this allows you to search for data within a bounding box. You can give it a uh, API endpoint, a dynamic API, and load up data there. And you can either download that data or you can, you can stream this data and, and view it. Uh, SAT API is, right now, it's the only reference implementation of the Stack API. So it is, in fact, a uh, WFS3 compliant um, server, for the most part, um, with Stack extensions built on top of it. Uh, this is um, written in Node, and it's deployable to AWS, and can be used to index any static catalog. So you can deploy SAT API, you can point this to really any, any leaf in, the, in a static catalog. It could be the top level catalog, it could be a collection, it could be any branch underneath it, and it will crawl that entire thing and index that into its Elasticsearch backend. Um, the nice thing here too is that you can use, you can use that to uh, index historical archives, uh, but then you can also subscribe to SNS topics and keep it up to date that way. So here we're just browsing through uh, Earth Search that we run at Element 84. It's an instance of SAT API. Um, and here, uh, much like the static catalog, we, instead, of, instead of the relative links here, we have, these, uh, uh, we have absolute links because it's an API. And so they're created dynamically. And now we can browse through the catalog fairly easily. Uh, SAT stack uh, is a series of um, it's really just a Python library that uh, is the, it has the Python classes in it that represent all of the entities in Stack. Uh, so that if you're doing any development in Python, this, this is a, actually a pretty useful tool. It's used to create static catalogs. Um, I've used it to create the Landsat and the Sentinel catalogs. So if you're creating your own catalog, th these are actually fairly useful libraries to perhaps take a look at. The Landsat one here uh, crawls the, um, well, it actually uses the index of Landsat scenes on, on AWS uh, that are added there by Planet. Uh, and there's also a Lambda function deployed. Uh, this isn't a library or tool that you would necessarily run yourself or use yourself, but it's currently running. There's a Lambda function that uh, listens for new scenes on, um, on AWS. It transforms those into the stack record, and then it publishes a new SNS topic uh, with the complete stack record inside the message so that SAT API, for instance, can, um, can listen to it. And uh, I think I'm almost out of time here. So uh, I'll quickly just go through the rest of these. Uh, SAT search, I think, is the most useful tool for end users. This allows you to search any stack compliant endpoint. It's a very simple library. It does not do any geospatial processing. It's simply just a client to um, ping the server with whatever search terms you want, and then you can download the original scenes as is. Um, it's a command line tool, and it's a Python library. So here we're uh, finding the intersection within a certain date time, and uh, there's this cool little calendar um, that it'll print out. So you can uh, easily just get 
I know it's not fancy, I know it's not some GUI, but I actually find this extremely useful because it's a quick and easy way to see what data is where. So now we're searching for cloud cover, less than 20. We have fewer scenes. You just color codes them depending on what the collection is. And now we're looking at Landsat 8. And those are our scenes. And we can save those results as a GeoJSON feature collection so that we can load those later and perhaps download the resulting scenes. Uh, SAT fetch is um, just built on top of SAT search. And it actually you, it requires GDAL and all that. Um, and it actually does, essentially it does clip and ship and stacking of bands. So you can take the results from SAT search and you can download just the area. So here we have in Goro Goro Crater in Tanzania, we have the footprint here of a Sentinel scene and of a Landsat scene. And here we search for all the Landsat scenes. There's 18 of them. So if you go to the Landsat Earth, Earth data search GUI and download these, these would be uh, a gigabyte a piece. That's 18 gigabytes. Uh, but here we can uh, fetch just the, just the region that we want. Um, in less than a minute. So it's, it's a pretty useful, quick and easy tool to be able to do this. Um, and here's the same with Sentinel. Now, the reason why I show this, uh, this example is because this really shows the power of stack. I've done, don't do this with uh, Sentinel 2. Uh, if you want to know why, ask Vincent over here or read his blog post on this. Um, but the reason why I show this example is because it shows the real power of stack here. I have, I have here used the same exact tool with the same area of interest saying, I want the red, green, blue bands uh, for two different sensors. And this is, this is the power. I don't care about what the actual sensor or data collection is. Uh, SAT API, API browser is something the development seed uh, recently released. It's just a, an, an alpha, really. Uh, and kind of like SAT search, it should be, you can point it at any stack compliant endpoint. Um, and, and search and save those results. Uh, intake stack is uh, just a plugin that we use for um, loading data into X arrays and run Dask. Uh, we're currently working on an element at adding stack support to NASA's common metadata repository. Um, and we have a publicly available endpoint, Earth Search, that indexes all of the uh, public data sets on AWS. So you can check that out. Um, you stack, if you're an expert in a data type and there's no extension for it, then uh, please let us know what that is, provide some input, and we, we, can, uh, we can get that added. Uh, follow me on Twitter for updates. There's going to be a lot of things happening in the next couple months uh, with updates to catalog, Sentinel-1 catalog, uh, and, and new software. So thank you. <laughs>